Good morning. Welcome to History 1112, World History 2. And this is your welcome message. And I'm just going to go over a couple of things in Blackboard and walk you through the first of the PowerPoints really quick. This is Blackboard, and I'm going to click where it says Syllabus to begin with. And I'm going to show you what the syllabus looks like. This is freshly updated, all new. And you can see my email address right here, jason.kennedy at westgatech.edu. I do have an office in Carrollton. You're welcome to stop by if you're in Carrollton. Or if you're near Douglasville on Mondays, you can stop by there as well. Uh, there is a textbook. You can purchase it from the West Georgia Tech webs website, the West Georgia Tech bookstore, or you can get it online somewhere if you'd like. Um, I will admit it is a little less expensive if you buy it elsewhere, but if you're using financial aid, then you can buy it straight from us. When it comes to makeup work, I don't allow any makeup work unless it's you know, an extraordinary circumstance. And the reason for that is I give you seven full days to do your work. So your work will open up um, Monday night at 11.59 and close Monday night at 11.59. You have a full seven days to do it. So please make sure you find some time during that seven day period to do your work because the makeup work is very, very, very unallowed, if that makes sense only extenuating circumstances with documentation. I know that sounds mean, but um, like I said, seven full days to do it. Uh, when it comes to plagiarism, please make sure that you do all of your own work. Don't use somebody else's work. Don't use things you find on the internet without properly citing and sourcing. Uh, don't use chat GPT or AI or anything like that. Uh, if you are discovered to do plagiarism or use AI when you're not allowed to, then that's a zero on the first assignment, and then uh, multiple instances will be reported to the, our Dean of Students. So please, just really, really, really easy to do this. Do your own work, and I'll give you credit for it. Here's your grading. Uh, there are two tests, a midterm and a final exam. There are three short little papers called reflection papers. There is a museum review, meaning you will have to go to a museum. There are weekly activities, quizzes, things like that you'll have to do, weekly discussion boards you'll have to do, and then a research paper that will take the entire semester. And I'll give you some updates throughout the semester on what you need to do. The rest of this is just a little bit of detail on each of the assignments. Uh, for the museum review, I do have a list of approved museums with the approximate cost. information on the activities, information on the research paper, discussion boards, and extra credit. And then finally, I have a course schedule, and for this first week, we're doing chapter 15. Um, that's going to include a student introduction discussion and a quiz based on the textbook. All of that is due by the 15th at 11.59 p.m. The next thing I'm going to do is click on Lessons. That way you get an idea of what it all looks like here. It, the class is divided up into folders for you. Uh, the first folder I want you to look at here is a reflection paper drop boxes. As I said, there are three reflection papers that you have to do throughout the semester, and they're going to be based on just various primary source readings I'm going to have you do throughout the semester. To submit your reflection paper, you'll click where it says reflection paper drop box. You will click the appropriate reflection paper drop box right here, reflection paper number one, and then you will submit. You'll upload your file and submit. There is only one drop box open at a time. That's to try to keep it easy for you and I, and that way you don't accidentally submit to the wrong box. The museum review drop box, first thing I want to draw your attention to, your museum review may be submitted at any time during the semester, but must be received no later than 11.59 p.m. on April 15th. So you have to visit one museum sometime during the semester, then you have to write a little review of that museum, and then you will submit it here to this museum review drop box. You'll upload a file there. The research paper drop box 
is right here. And it's not just one Dropbox, there's actually going to be multiple Dropboxes. And what I need you to do for this research paper is choose a topic that is appropriate to the class. Basically, find something that you're interested in that has happened since the year 1500. Maybe you're interested in World War I. Maybe you're interested in World War II. Maybe you're interested in King Louis XIV. Um, maybe you're interested in uh, Queen Victoria. Whatever it is, you're going to choose your own topic that is course appropriate. And then we're going to build a research paper based on that topic. There are several drop boxes. The only drop box you'll see open right now is a topic choice and abstract. And with this topic choice and abstract, you're just going to choose a topic. Tell me why you want to research that topic and what you hope to learn. And you have instructions here that will break it down a little bit further for you. Then you have our individual chapters, and each of these folders tells you a little bit about what you're going to be doing. So chapter 15, review the syllabus, complete the student introduction discussion, read chapter 15 of the textbook, complete the chapter 15 quiz, chapter 16, chapter 17, etc., etc. When you click on the actual chapter, you'll see the textbook pages that you have to read. This is based on the physical, <clears throat> the physical copy of it. Where it says Chapter 15 PowerPoint, that is just a simple PowerPoint that came with the book. And then you have the textbook I created, or not textbook, but the PowerPoint that I created called The Rise of Empires in the Americas for Chapter 15. The quiz is based on the reading. Student introduction, that is based on you and your experiences. And then you have optional videos. If you're somebody who needs a little bit of extra help, if you're somebody who enjoys watching videos maybe, or you're a visual learner, then I have included some videos that will help you with the same material that I am going to be lecturing on. And then you got chapter 16, which will look exactly the same. And then chapter 17, there's one little difference when we get here, and that is a primary source reading. So for chapter 17, you've got one primary source document to read. You'll use that primary source document to do your discussion questions here. Also, the primary source document, that's what we use to do our reflection paper. And I'll give more details on the reflection paper the week that that is due in a video much like this. Okay, so for the rest of the video, I want to go over the information that is in this slideshow right here, this chapter 15 slideshow. All right, for this chapter 15 slideshow, The Rise of Empires in the Americas. The first thing I wanted to show you, um, how did people get to North America? We have two different theories. One is that they walked from Siberia to Alaska. A uh, couple thousand years ago, the sea levels were lower. You could walk between Asia and North America, and the people who did it were probably looking for their food. A second theory that is slowly becoming fact is quite simply people just floated on canoes and boats and things like that from the Pacific Islands to Central and South America. The people who came to the Americas were pretty much hunter-gatherers, meaning they had to find everything. There was no agriculture until fairly recent times. And there were some pretty significant sized civilizations here in America. Uh, the Hohokam near Phoenix, the Anasazi in New Mexico, and these are fairly complex societies as well. When you go to Central North America and Eastern North America, you get a group known as the Adena culture or the Mississippian culture. Uh, both of them are known for building mounds. Uh, sometimes they're in the shape of animals, sometimes they just look like pyramids. And here in Georgia, we have a couple of very good examples of Mississippian culture. Near Cartersville is the Etowa site, near Macon is the Akmulgee site, and down in a place called Blakely, which is southwest Georgia, there's the Kolomoki site. Uh, these are fairly well preserved. They show lots of evidence of people living in those areas for hundreds of years. But the best known site overall of the Mississippian culture is near St. Louis in a place called Cahokia, 
we've actually uncovered remnants of a city that was like 30 or 40,000 people that came and went and disappeared before Europeans were even here. But overall, uh, the Mississippian culture and the Adena culture, they're both very well known for building mounds. In Central America, specifically Mexico, there was a group of people known as the Toltecs. And the Toltecs were the dominant force in Mexico for about 300 years. Uh, they were known for developing a sword made out of wood and obsidian. Obsidian is a type of glass from volcanoes. They traded with all of their neighbors. And they were very, very decorative with their statues and with their building. Eventually, the Toltec civilization is going to fall apart um, around 1180 or so. Their territory will be invaded from the north and from the northwest, and their society collapses. Uh, the Mayans are from southern Mexico or northern Central America, the Yucatan Peninsula. And the Mayans were, they coexisted with the Toltecs for a while, and they were around probably until the year 1000 or so, maybe a little after, and then their society kind of fell apart. And the ruins were actually rediscovered in 1839, and we've been discovering more and more about them since then. They grew to be very large, and because of this, they caused environmental changes that led to their undoing. Uh, there was a drought they started sacrificing people, trying to get it to rain again, and when it did rain, it rained so much it washed away all the topsoil. Uh, they played a game called Poke to Poke, where you took a little rubber ball and you tried to put it through a hoop. Uh, sounds innocent enough until you think of it as a game of good versus evil. The winners were considered good and got rewards. The losers were considered evil and they got sacrificed. Um, the Mayans also had a hieroglyphic language that we can read. And they knew all about math, they knew about astronomy, they had a very accurate calendar, and they understood and were able to comprehend the idea of zero, which is something some European cultures couldn't do until much later. I'm going to skip this. This would be a video that I watch in class. In South America, in the Andes, there was two groups called the Tiwanaku and the Wari. They were competing cities that kind of started the civilization in South America in the Andes. And they came up with this idea of community labor and community celebrations. And they were very powerful for a time. They, they traded with their neighbors, but eventually they're going to be outshined by another group of people. And I'll get to them in a moment. Back to Mexico, you've got the Aztecs. And the Aztecs, they're going to be dominant for about a 150-year period. And it's thought that the Aztecs were the ancestors, the descendants of the Toltecs. The Aztecs were not very well liked. They were known for ritualistic cannibalism. They were known for sacrifices. Uh, they would conquer their enemies, take them over, force everybody to be loyal to their emperor and because they had so many enemies they were actually kind of easy to defeat when Hernan Cortez and the Spanish come to Mexico they gather the enemies of the Aztec and use their enemies against them much like the Toltecs the Aztecs used those obsidian weapons they had a very large army they had military schools and probably the most unique thing about them is they had floating fields. They lived on an island in the middle of a lake near, well, exactly where Mexico City is today. And they would make these wooden rafts. They would pile grass and dirt and everything else on these rafts, and then they would grow food on them. And these floating fields were known as chinampas. In some places in Mexico and in Central America, this idea of a chinampa is still used, and in some cases, people actually live on these chinampas. Then, back in South America, we have the Inca. Uh, the Inca, 
they are going to be neighbors of the Wari and Tiwanaku, but they're going to grow much, much stronger, and they become the strongest civilization in South America. Um, they end up stretching over 2,000 miles from modern-day Ecuador to modern-day Chile. Uh, the emperor is all-powerful, and you had taxes to pay, but instead of having to like pay gold or silver or some sort of money, you paid your taxes by doing service for the emperor, and this was called the mita. So you had to perform some sort of work, build something or do something, a public service, if you will, for the emperor. They also had a series of knotted ropes called kipu, and the kipu would keep track of tax records, population, um, whatever was needed by putting different sorts of beads and different sorts of knots into ropes, and then those ropes would be stored. Finally, the language is called Quechua, and I have known two Quechua speakers in my time, and Quechua was the official language of the Inca Empire, and it is still spoken today in parts of Ecuador. All right, nice and short, about 15 minutes. If you would do me a favor, send me an email saying you watch this. And if you send me an email between today, which is the 10th of January, and the 15th of January, if you send me an email saying, hey, I watched the entire video, I'm going to give you a free 100 as a thank you for doing that. Any questions, send me an email, and I hope to hear from you. Bye.